Um, when I said it wasn't Esau, when Jacob wrestles with the Lord, maybe I shouldn't have said it's, it's not Esau. Because the whole situation is about Esau. Jacob's coming back to Canaan and he's afraid to face Esau because he did something really bad. He stole his blessing and deceived him. And Esau's going to kill him. And Esau's a great hunter. He's like the original Nimrod. Or he's like the new Nimrod. Um... And he promises, he vows he's going to kill him the next time he sees him. So Jacob's really afraid to come back. And that's also why the Lord comes to him kind of as Esau, maybe. Maybe it is Esau, like a shadow of Esau. But if it is Esau, it's Esau, like in the spirit of the Lord. Like, for lack of a better term, completely possessed by the Spirit of the Lord and probably wouldn't even remember what happened, if that is Esau's physical body. But the reason it could be Esau is because it is all about Esau. Jacob's like, I did something so bad, I can, how can I go back? And the Lord's like, it'll be okay. If you trust me, it'll be okay. You can go back. And he's like, how can it be okay? Like, I can't take that back. I did something so bad. And it's not so bad because the Lord says, you did something so bad. It's because he says, I did something so bad. He feels so bad. He's so scared to face him. Even though his mother told him to do it, whatever. And he's like, it's impossible to make it right what I did. It's done. I did it. It's impossible for it to be okay. But the Lord's like... No, you're, you're not Jacob anymore. You're a whole new person now. I changed your heart. I make it okay somehow. If you just trust me, you're a whole new person now. Somehow it is okay. Okay, real quick. I was reading this part in Ezekiel chapter 8 where he's having visions and the Lord is showing him the abominations the ancients of Israel are doing and the rulers. Just listen to this. What does this remind you of? What do you think of? He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. So it's like a secret door. The, door, the Lord shows him somehow a secret door into this secret room. He digs in the wall and finds a way in, a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. And he's at the temple. So it's like some kind of secret room in the inner temple or under the temple or something, a secret room of the temple. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand. But think of censer also like a computer censer. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? In the dark, like underground, underground base. Do in the dark every man in the chamber of his imagery. And, you know, you could think traditionally like idols all around them, but think also of chamber of imagery like virtual environment. Like a, every man in the chamber of his Im imagery, like a sense pod, like a, you know, like a, like a virtual reality thing. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. 
So when I read this, I thought, oh my God, it's like the underground, you know, the base, like cloning. When I went in and saw every form of creeping things, like reptile, aliens, and abominable beasts, I think like gene splicing, you know, cloning, chimeras. And the chamber of the image, chamber of imagery, like the shit they're doing with the simulations and the virtual environments and the project, psychotronic projection and MK scenarios and shit. Um, but back then, it's like, it's like the skins on the video game. Like back then, it's like a secret room under the temple, and like now it's an underground base, like a dumb, like, and. Now it's this, and cloning, and then it's like chimeras, and creeping things, and in the future, another video game skin, it's aliens, and whatever. But I read it to my wife to see what she would think it was, and she was like, oh, I thought he opened, like a portal, God opened a portal into hell for him, and showed Ezekiel that they, what they were like in hell, what was going on. And I was like, whoa, are they the same thing? Like, hell, like now it's that, like the underground base, then it's this, like maybe she's right. And it just changes with the skins of the video game. Like back in Bible times, the prophets are like, look, all our weather is controlled. Can't you see angels are controlling all the weather? There's angels carrying, you know, doing everything. Our whole system is controlled by angels from God. And everyone else is like, what are you nuts, dude? The weather is random, just completely random. And the prophets are like, look, look, dude, there's an angel right there, like, directing the weather. And the people are like, dude, that's just the, like, kind of a weird cloud. It's just a cloud, it's just like condensation trail, just a weird cloud. Nowadays, nowadays, truthers are like, our weather is completely controlled. Can't you see? Up in the sky, look what they're doing. Our weather is completely controlled. It's like some kind of controlled system. You can't see the so on and so forth, planes, whatever. And people are like, dude, the weather is completely random. That's just like a weird cloud, just a regular cloud, kind of a weird cloud. Like, and it just changes like the skins on a video game. Like, and this, every man in the chamber of his imagery, each one with a sensor in his hand. Every he goes in a secret door in the temple, and it remind me of this um, Jim Keith book with this woman, Catherine Sullivan. I read this way back in the day. According to Sullivan, she was programmed by NASA personnel at various locations, including Huntsville, Alabama, blah, 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 blah. At Goddard, she says that the programmers dressed in Star Trek uniforms in order to confuse and discredit the memories of those they programmed as a scramble for their memory. She believes that at Goddard, she was hooked up to a helmet. This is like as a child. She was linked to a computer. She was hooked up to a helmet that was linked to a computer system, apparently some kind of virtual reality system, since when she closed her eyes, images would flash in front of her face. Sullivan describes alleged NASA conditioning called father time training, which involved real or imaginary dimensional travel. Hard to say. I can imagine it is hard to say. Sullivan says that NASA specialized in time folding and going back in time, at least in our minds. Children met read Madeline Lengel books. This kind of programming really messed up my head. That the virtual reality chamber hooked up to a helmet Every man with his sensor in the chamber of his imagery. That's what it made me think of. Okay, this video is going to be generally about... I'm going to try and talk about the law. The law. I'm not sure if I'll ever actually... Um really get to any point, but that's what I'm going to try and talk about, the law. And then my next video is going to be, the. I'm going to start a new series. It's going to, I'm going to read a story, a story I wrote, like my own Bible stories. That's what the new series is going to be. 
Um, it's not from the Bible. I just kind of, I just wrote it in that kind of style and mode of speaking and everything. Um, and it's going to be called like Earth after Armageddon or after resurrection or something like that. And that'll be the first video of that. I'm going to do these stories. And if you don't think I should be writing my own Bible stories, I'm just going to have to take that up with my legal team. So Matthew 25, 29. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. So... If there is one Lord of spirits, Lord of hosts, and we are the host of humanity, we are the host of that one spirit. And we can imagine that one great spirit of humanity at large to be like water. Our consciousness, our awareness is like water, and we all share that water amongst us. And since the water represents the spirit, or pure energy, awareness, it is one fixed quantity throughout the entire creation. It can neither be created nor destroyed. And the waters were divided, the waters above from the waters below. The consciousness in time, in physicality. And the waters were divided, the waters above from the waters below. The consciousness and time and physicality, the body, us, humanity, and the consciousness outside of time, outside of physicality, the spirit, the Lord, and our individuated mind in physicality, and the collective subconscious above and over, the collective superconscious above and over us outside of time, the waters above. So we have the collective subconscious, the waters below, and the collective superconscious, the waters above, outside of time, inside of time, and, and outside of time. And our physical bodies are like stones amongst the water. And our dead physical bodies are the negative space between the water of spirit, flowing around and amongst us and connecting us all. And you can imagine this physical um, world as a flat 2D surface, like a stretched out tarp inanimate, and it's featureless, and there's no activity. Then when the water of spirit is poured onto this 2D surface, it bows down and curves, and the water gives it form and motion and curvature. It bends this 2D screen, the tarp, the world, from the weight of the water, and it becomes three-dimensional. And all the people, all the bodies, all the negative spaces are like stones spread out all over this tarp. And some, some stones are heavy and some are light. And every mass in between. And the water collects around the stones on the tarp. The water always flows to where the weight of the stones draw it. And it used to seem like there were very, very many stones of similar weight, so the water was all, almost evenly distributed across the tarp, amongst the stones. But in this end time, we can observe that most of the stones have somehow disappeared. When we look with our regular eyes, with our conscious ego mind, we still see them. We still see their bodies. We still see the stones in, 
In fact, the image, the illusion, the construct, the Y machine, in its manner, shows us the inversion, the upside down, the exact opposite. The Y machine shows us a population explosion, an out of control proliferation of stones on the tarp, like a red algae bloom. But when we look with our spirit, with our magic eye, with our spiritual eyes, we see less and less stones. The proliferation of stones is an illusion. The projection of some desperate survival mechanism of the environment. What makes a stone a stone is that it holds weight. And when we look with our spiritual eyes, we see that the vast proliferation of stones hold no weight. They are not drawn in the spirit. They draw in no water. No water flows amongst them. No spirit flows amongst them. It's like they are just a movie prop now. They look like regular stones, but they are actually made of styrofoam. They are weightless. So we know they are not real because the spiritual mechanics, the truth of reality shows that to us, that the water does not gather to them or flow amongst them. So maybe this is like the rapture. Rather than half the stones disappearing in an instant physically, they're disappearing spiritually one by one and leaving behind this styrofoam shell. And since spirit can be neither created nor destroyed, even though most of the stones have disappeared, the quantity of water is still the same. The same one spirit, the Lord of spirits, the one living God. And as more and more stones disappear, more and more of the water, more awareness, more consciousness, gathers to the weight of the remaining stones. So that now there are billions of styrofoam stones holding no weight and drawing no water to them. And all the water, all the awareness is gathering around the few remaining real stones that hold weight. The Lord is the Lord of spirits, the Lord of hosts, and the hosts are human bodies, and the body of Christ is the macro-dimensional organism. It is all our bodies on a higher level, where like a colony of bacteria or fungus, we act with one unified will, which is over our individuated consciousness. The whole human organism outside of time. The whole tree from which all our long bodies and generations branch off. And the spirit, the Lord of spirits, is the spirit, the consciousness of that macro-dimensionally integrated body of the whole human race outside of time. And that spirit controls the entirety and every minutia of what we perceive to be reality. And that spirit of the Lord does only what is good and fruitful for us. It shapes reality perfectly in order to bring about exactly what we want. Even though it doesn't look that way to us from inside down here, that is what it is doing, exactly what we want. But what we want on the deepest level, collectively, our greatest true purpose to bloom, to fix this, to beat the satanic game, transcend time and physicality, 
to overcome entropy and loss and ultimately to draw closer to the Lord, our deepest, truest purpose is up. And so when we feel that we are being unjustly persecuted or made to suffer or that circumstances are against us and we cannot perceive how this could possibly be what we really want, uh, we can only trust that circumstances really are proceeding towards our greatest good, though it is above the ceiling, the physical limit limitation of our comprehension. Because the Lord is always going to manifest what you really want, which is the highest possible good for you, but not the little you, not the hot dogs and blowjobs, the fake made-up name you, which is embarrassing. They pointed to a piece of paper with a completely fake made-up name, and they told us, this is you, and we believe them. But not that you, not the little you, but the whole you, the big you, us. Just like you don't give your child a candy bar, even though he thinks it's what he wants, but what he really wants is broccoli. He just can't comprehend that because he wants to be big and strong and healthy. The Lord is the Lord of hosts, and just like you on a personal level, as the Lord of your host, if you have a tumor and malignancy growing in some of the cells of your body, you aren't going to do what is best for the tumor or for the diseased cells. You're going to cut it out. You're going to do what is best for the whole body. If you have an infection and develop gangrene in your pinky toe, you, as the Lord of your host, are not going to do what is best for your pinky toe. You're going to have to do what you have to do to preserve the health of your body for the remnant that can be preserved. So even though you love your pinky toe and you're attached to your pinky toe, you cut it off. If you have lice, even though you love your hair, you don't do what's best for your hair. You shave it off to preserve the health of your body. Why would God exterminate and drive out whole populations of people and literally uproot them from the land? literally turn the garden over and plow the crop under. Men, women, children, and beasts. God says their ways were an abomination to Him. They're sacrificing their babies to Moloch for financial advantage. They worship Mammon and the Queen of Heaven and demonic entities in exchange for wickedness, violence, and might over other men. If what we really want, our true spirit and will, is to bloom into a better consciousness, a better heart, and draw up closer to the Lord and transcend the inherent loss and limitation of this broken world, and somehow exist in an eternal and perfect civilization, if that is our true will, then the Lord is executing, if that is our true will that the Lord is executing, then those civilizations are never going to produce the necessary circumstance, the banks of circumstance, the reality canals to achieve that to make that change in consciousness possible. The stories we need, the people and events of the Bible wouldn't have taken place. Christ couldn't have proceeded. The necessary banks of circumstance had to be constructed in order to manifest what we really wanted. So, if my whole garden is destroyed by flood, 
and I am left with only 10 seeds of my special strain that I loved and crafted to grow into something indescribably rare and incredible. I must very carefully plant those 10 seeds, which are in rough shape, and tend to them very carefully. And there are one or two best plants I must preserve and take cuttings from until I feel more secure having proliferated 100 clones from those two last strong plants in the whole world. Now I pollinate one plant with the other, and the female plant bears seed, and I take 1,000 seeds from this last strong stock. And I finally replant my garden, hoping this cycle to achieve a full bloom of my strain and bring forth as much beautiful, incredibly rare, flowering, crystalline fruit as I am able to. The seeds are good seed, and 800 plants populate my garden and grow up strong and complete the vegetative stage of their growth. But as the plants are mid-bloom, 100 of the plants are infected by parasites, and I'm forced to uproot them all and burn them before the infestation spreads any further. A fungal infection also infects the plants, and with a carefully administered and nurtured tea of beneficial bacteria, you, I'm able to eliminate the fungus, but the stress is too much, and 400 more plants perish and are burned. But I still have 300 healthy plants, and they are about to bloom. And I know that if I can only harvest one fruitful flowering crystal, all my labor will be rewarded a thousandfold because one flowering crystal fruit produces a perfect fruitful seed eternally and abundantly. In the final stage of bloom, strangling vines begin to grow up around the plants. And I try to pull out the weeds, but I destroy the plants they're attached to in the process. About half of them. So I have no choice but to just stand by and watch closely and hope. And luckily a handful of the plants are strong enough to persevere to full bloom. And I have a beautiful harvest. And all the toil is forgotten. So the law is for us. The law is to get us what we really want. Um, like if, if we look in Ezekiel chapter 4 and 5. Ezekiel is representing the Lord punishing Jerusalem. And he's also representing Jerusalem being punished. It's like he's punishing himself. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city of Jerusalem and lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it. Take an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron. He's like making a little model of the city. And set thy face against it and it shall be besieged. It's like he's doing it and it's like half, then it happens in real life. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. He's locked in his house, like sick, whatever, has to lay down for like over a year. One day for every year, he has to bear the iniquity, and he's like also the Lord. He's acting it all out. And then in chapter 5, And now, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon mine head and upon thine beard. He cuts his hair off. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part of it, the hair, in the midst of the city. And when the days of the siege are fulfilled, thou shalt take a third part and smite it with a knife, and a third part shall scatter in the wind. And I will draw, draw the sword after, and he keeps a tiny bit. 
Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in, in thy skirt. So he's like the Lord and it's his own hair is like the people. And he's the one punishing them, the one saving them, punishing himself. It's like, then take of them again and cast them in the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For therefore shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. It's like if we look at Jeremiah 7.19. It's like the Lord is doing, like you're doing it to yourself. Like he's, he, he, the law is for you. Jeremiah 7.19. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Like this, like he's besieging himself. He's sick, he's the one making him sick. The city's under siege, he's the one sieging it, and he's the city. It's like... He's like, you idiots, just do what I say and we can, and everything will work out. Like, do they provoke me to anger, say it, the Lord? Like, I don't care, I'm the Lord. They need it. Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? So, when I talk about the law, I'm talking about the law that is written on our heart. Not the law of Leviticus or Deuteronomy or the laws of men. And I'm not saying there's not a reason for those laws or that you shouldn't follow them. But I'm just saying that's not written on my heart. I don't know all those laws by heart. If you feel led to try and follow all those ordinances, you should. But what's written on my heart is this law. And this is what I'm talking about. Like, that, that law, Leviticus, is just to build the civilization to even have this law, to even come close to this law. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great, I thought, I always thought it's the greatest, but which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law. That's the reason for all the law and all the prophets. And that's what should be written on our heart if we really look. And the Lord is like the highest good. We just imagine up, uprightness, our moral compass, that, that line inside you. You keep it upright, focused straight up all the time. It's like David says, Thy law is perfection. I meditate upon thy law like night and day. I meditate upon perfection. Thy law is perfection. I meditate upon thy law night and day. Like, our will, our intent, our imagination, our focus, that's what happens. So, you're not supposed to think about what you don't want, what you don't like all the time. Even if you're against it, you're giving it your attention. You're supposed to think all the time of what you do want and imagine what we do want, how we do want things to be. You're supposed to meditate upon perfection night and day. So, the law is for you. It's what you're supposed to do to have a fruitful experience. The law isn't for God. God doesn't need the law. That's why he says, do they provoke me to anger? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Like, you can't really comprehend why you're here, but if you follow this spiritual science, the law you will have a more fruitful or rich or whatever you want to call it experience. Like imagine if you're in a video game and you want to hunt for items and go on this big quest and see what the game is all about. 
but like 90% of the players you're supposed to be questing with are literally just walking into walls and falling in holes and shooting each other and using all their potions all at once. But mostly just walking into the wall for hours. It's like your grandparents trying to play Skyrim or World of Warcraft or something. And you're like, dude, come on, follow me. Let's explore and go on quests and shit and see what the game is all about. And everyone else is like, why, why? And you're like, because that's the rules of the game. And they're like, fuck you. We can do whatever we want. We're not slaves. And you're like, yeah, I know you can do whatever you want, but... You're just walking into the corner of the wall and getting stuck in holes. Just follow me and we'll have an interesting, exciting time. And I don't know what exactly, but I'm sure something will happen better than just being stuck in a hole. And everyone's like, why is there law? Well, well, why did God put me stuck in this hole and walking into the corner of the wall my whole life? Wah, wah. And you're like, look, let's just play by the rules of the game and just see what happens. And they're like, we're going to kill you, you self-righteous, oppressive liar. And uh, then they just go back to falling in holes and treadmilling in the corner for another thing. And it's kind of like a test of your being or your amness your amness or something before you can even start the game and the test is the law to defy everything the whole world tells you everything you see with your normal eyes and your normal brain you defy the entire data set and you do the right thing anyway you do the upright thing anyway. The law that's written on your heart. That's like your secret name, your amnes, your compass of uprightness, your sense of up and down is the law written on your heart. But the test is a test of your amnes because Satan comes before you and he says, I can give you anything this world has to offer. Power, money, sex, fame, knowledge, honors. To get what you want, all you have to do is follow a certain set of instructions and want it more than anything else. Those are the only two conditions. That's it. You don't have to be very smart or very brave or very good, or very bad, or any other human metric. It has nothing to do with human metrics. It is purely mechanical. To get anything this world has to offer, you must want it more than anything else, and you must follow a set of instructions. And the precision with which you follow the set of instructions determines how successful you will be at achieving anything this world has to offer, your focus and your single-mindedness. And the instructions could be anything. They would probably take different forms in the different skins of different ages. It could just be the stars, or it could be some demonic beast in the deep forest, or in a different age, it's the oracle at Delphi. Nowadays, it's probably some sentient digital entity or entities, AIs, giving the instructions. Or it could just be perfectly following subliminal behavioral cues issued from the screen by the monolithic entity. But if you want it more than anything else, and you follow the instructions perfectly... There's no limit to how much power or money or knowledge or whatever you can have. To the extent that to a normal person, 
you basically appear like a god. Like, it seems like there's no limit to your power, and you can just do whatever you want. But by the time you reach that godlike level of attainment of anything this world has to offer, you followed the instructions so perfectly that basically you've lost your free will. Because all of your activity completely consists of perfectly following the instructions dictated to you in whatever fashion by your environment. by the environment. So you are so you are actually just like an extension, an avatar of the environment itself. It's dictating all your actions. Because in order to attain your power and to retain it, constantly maintain it, you must act strictly within this program you are given, these instructions. So really you're a slave. Or you're more like a referee, or an umpire, or a stagehand, or something like that. So even though you look kind of godlike and like you're doing whatever you want to the regular humans, really you just wish you were a human. But you're stuck. It's like being a ball boy or a professional soccer referee. Do you think it was those guys' lifelong dream to be a professional soccer referee? No. He wanted to be a professional soccer player. But he acts like he always wanted that, and that it's great around regular humans. He's like, yes, I am a god. It's fantastic. Look at me. But as soon as they leave, they start crying. So that's why it's a test of your amnesty to defy the entire environment telling you to care about the wrong things and to be the wrong things. And do what you know you're supposed to do anyway, which has nothing to do with money or fame or power or anything else this world has to offer. You have to be something without all that. Be something just all on your own. A secret. A secret purpose. Something you would do even though no one will ever know it. That's like your secret name. Your amnesty.